Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining this ROS2 ML working group today. Um, welcome to our 15th uh, meeting. This is the last meeting of the year, and we have prepared a very interesting agenda. I'm going to share with you again the meeting notes for those who arrived a bit late. So, my name is Maria Merlan. For those who don't know me, um, I work in product management in Proxima with Pablo Garrido, who is the technical uh, lead of Micros. Um, please add your names to the attendee list here. Um, if you have any topic um, you are interested in and you want to discuss, please add it to the miscellaneous section at the end of, of this agenda. Okay. So today, as you must have seen already, we have several speakers. Uh, first, we have a presentation by Anne Norman from Bosch on diagnostics. Then uh, we have Patrick Bronca Giolo, um, he will talk about his contribution on RT EMS, uh, RTOS support. And after that, uh, Thomas mm, and Alex Malky from Piaf will be presenting a benchmark analysis on Microroad Galactic. And finally, Pablo will make an update, a quick update on about the latest enhancements of Microroads, like our CLC actions, among others. Um, I think uh, what I want to thank all the speakers in advance, and I encourage the attendees to raise questions uh, at the end of the presentations, please. Let's start with Anne. Um, so all this right. presentation is about diagnostics. Um, would you please share your screen? Yeah, I will try that. Tell me when you can see it. Okay. We can see your screen. Okay, perfect. You. So my name is Arne Nordmann. I'm with Bosch Corporate Research. And um, today I want to show you um, the MicroRoS diagnostics framework that we implemented within the MicroRoS project. And this is what I want to do now um, today with you. That is, I will quickly go over how ROS2 diagnostics looks like um, in the general case, so not in the micro ROS control, microcontroller case. Then I will quickly uh, draw some requirements and the architecture of the micro ROS diagnostics framework. And then I show you uh, the actual implementation we came up with. And in the end, I want to show you some to-dos and issues that we still have and our future plans. So ROS2 Diagnostics, that is the, the diagnostics framework in the vanilla ROS2. Um, that was ported also within the MicroOS project in 2020. Um, I myself ported the aggregator. Um, it's implemented in RCL CPP and RCL PI. And you can see the main parts on the right side. So um, first of all, it defines uh, its own message type that is within diagnostic messages. Um, it's basically a diagnostic status and an array of diagnostic status messages. I uh, will detail that on the next slide. Um, also, a uh, central part is the updater. The updater is um, a software entity that regularly publishes diagnostic status. Um, that is usually um, done to report on the status of, for example, a ROS driver, but uh, it can also be uh, about a ROS node, the status uh, of a ROS node. And then there is an aggregator which aggregates all the status messages that are sent by all the updaters in your ROS system and sort of sorts the, the status messages, aggregates them, and these can then be um, displayed in the robot monitor that has a 
like the general diagnostic level of your system. So do you have an error, a warning, or is everything fine? And a more detailed list of all the different status uh, you might be interested in. As I said, there is also um, something called self-test if a component, a ROS node is reporting about itself and not about a driver or a motor sensor and so on. All right, the messages that are usually um, communicated is the diagnostic status and the diagnostic array. The diagnostic status looks like that. It has um, a general stat diagnostic level, which is okay, warning, error, or stale. Um, that is the name of the updater that is indicating who is sending the status. Um, then it can contain an actual diagnostic message that could be a string describing, for example, the error or the warning. Um, then it has a hardware ID in it describing for which entity this is uh, reporting because you might have an updater uh, reporting about the motor and that would then be the actual ID of the motor or the sensor and so on. And then you have an array of key value pairs and these are uh, the, the key and the value is a string again. And this is now the actual, like the value you want to report that could be the temperature of the motor or the currently consumed current or something like that. And this is a diagnostic status. And what you usually send around as an updater is a diagnostic array, which is just an array of this diagnostic status. And these messages, these diagnostic arrays are aggregated by the diagnostic aggregator. And that's it basically. That's the um, ROS2 diagnostic framework. All right, and we want to bring wanted to bring that on microcontrollers as well. And the general requirements we had in mind was uh, our microcontroller diagnostics should integrate with ROS2 diagnostics. So we want to reuse as much as possible and only execute the necessary parts on the microcontroller. Um, but we have to run diagn some diagnostics part on the microcontroller, obviously. We want to use as little resources as possible. Um, and all of that maps to the more technical requirements. Implementation has to be done in C. Um, and the message types can't have any arrays and can't have any dynamic sized strings. You saw on the previous slide, uh, the, the status, the current diagnostic messages have arrays and strings all over the place. But we want to avoid that to avoid basically any dynamic memory allocation. All right. So this is the architecture that we came up with. The aggregator and uh, a monitor, they, these remain untouched. We want, uh, we still want to run them on the ROS2 PC, so um, not on the microcontroller. But we implemented micro ROS diagnostics um, to be able to run updaters on the microcontroller. And these publish to a dedicated topic because um, we need, we had to implement our own micro-ROS diagnostic message types that come without dynamic strings and arrays. As I said, we want to avoid dynamic memory allocation. So what is also missing and that is also part of our architecture is a um, what we call a micro-ROS diagnostic bridge that takes these micro-ROS diagnostic messages on this uh, micro ROS diagnostics topics and translates them into vanilla ROS2 diagnostic messages that are then read and handled by the vanilla ROS2 diagnostic aggregator. So this is the general architecture. Um, we have another package um, in mind, which is called common diagnostics. We want to provide like common monitors that you would expect um, most of the people to run on a microcontroller. For example, uh, monitoring the heap or something like that. Um, but this package is not um, very elaborate yet. It's basically currently just an example package. All right, that's the architecture. And now I tell you about the state of the implementation. Um, 
we implemented this architecture with, um, as I said, custom messages and based on RCLC, that is the ROS client library in C and in RCLCPP, but that is only the diagnostic bridge because that is supposed to run on the PC. Um, MicroOS Diagnostics Framework is currently under active development by Bosch and by Capra Robotics. Um, we have five merged pull requests within the last one and a half months, so pretty active. Um, and the entire framework consists of four packages that are the messages, the updater, the bridge, and as I said, the common diagnostics package, although this is uh, not to elaborate yet. And now we'll uh, lead you through these uh, packages. Um, first of all, the messages. Um, we uh, don't provide the diagnostics array uh, because we want to um, avoid arrays completely, but we provide a micro ROS diagnostic status. And this should have all the information in it that the um, Use the, the common diagnostic status has in it as well, but we had to do some modifications in order to avoid strings. So um, it has the same diagnostic level as the ROS2 diagnostic status. That is, it's um, the, the diagnostic level is either okay, worn, error, or stale. That is basically unchanged. Um, we also need to have the updater ID and the hardware ID in it. You remember that were strings in the ROS2 diagnostic status. So we had to come up with a solution for that as well. And what we did is we encode the updater and hardware ID strings in a lookup table. So in this message, you can see these are just integers and they are referring to a lookup table. And I have an exam exemplary lookup table on the right. And this one has um, in the upper box, these are hardware IDs uh, where we uh, associate with integer IDs, uh, an actual string that could be the hardware ID. And also we have a list of updaters that have also an ID and then a name and description and whatnot. So in our Micros diagnostic status, you will only have integer updater ID and hardware ID, but with the lookup table, it can be translated to the actual strings. Then we don't have an array of key value pairs as the ROS2 diagnostic status has it, but only one key and one value. And the key is also an ID referring to the lookup table. If you look at the exemplary lookup table, uh, processor reporting, uh, um, uh, update a reporting about processor could have two keys, for example, uh, reporting about the temperature and the load. And um, this is also again encoded with the ID and the string um, of the status could be looked up in the lookup table. The value can be either a Boolean or an integer or a double or a string. And that string is again an ID um, referring to the lookup table. So um, to come up with a stupid example, I have uh, an updater that checks google.com and um, we want to have um, the, the actual diagnostic value as a string, okay, not found or server error. Um, so in our MicroOS diagnostic, message, we would have just the ID of the string and then with the lookup table, we can get the value again. All right, um, and these messages are sent by our diagnostics updaters. These are um, implemented on top of RCLC, that is the ROS client library in C. Um, and they are basically a list of diagnostic tasks. And these diagnostic tasks are C function pointers. So the diagnostic updater knows which C functions to call in order to get the information that we want to send out with the um, diagnostic status message. Now the target configuration um, is, our target configuration is that we want to run only one updater per microcontroller because it actually consumes um, quite a lot of resources. Uh, one updater currently has uh, more than 350 words. Um, I think a publisher has only 10% of that roughly. But we came up with a um, version that 
one micro ROS diagnostic updater can emulate many logical updaters. Um, because we moved the updater ID and the hardware ID to the diagnostic task. So one diagnostic updater can execute a lot of diagnostic tasks, several diagnostic tasks, and these can pretend to come from different updaters and even different hardwares. All right. Then the third important part is the diagnostic bridge that translates micro ROS diagnostic messages that I just showed you to vanilla ROS2 diagnostic messages. It's implemented in RCLCPP because it uh, runs on the PC. It listens to the micro ROS diagnostics topic and receives micro ROS diagnostic status messages and it outputs accordingly diagnostic arrays on the um, common hard-coded ROS diagnostics topic that is just slash diagnostics. Um, it resolves all the IDs it finds in the micro ROS diagnostic status message according to the lookup table and then and with that can translate it to all the strings that are contained in the ROS2 diagnostic message. Now currently that is uh, just a one-to-one -one mapping so when the bridge receives one micro ROS diagnostic message it will create exactly one diagnostic array with exactly one diagnostic status and one value in it. That is um, the most simple and naive implementation, but uh, we have an issue um, to work on that and extend this that the bridge may um, like aggregate over a certain time, several micro ROS diagnostic um, status messages and then send one array out into the ROS system. That brings me already to our future plans and to-dos. So we have um, still uh, some open issues. I checked today, there's eight open issues. Uh, one, I already told you, aggregation in, a, in the bridge component, that it's not no longer just a one-to-one -one mapping from micro-ROS diagnostic messages to ROS diagnostic messages, but a slightly more elaborate strategy. Um, another issue that uh, I want to resolve is an automated system test. Um, so that could be um, a launch file containing everything that we consider a micro ROS diagnostic um, system, micro ROS uh, updaters publishing continuously and uh, vanilla ROS2 aggregate, aggregating these and, and checking that everything fits together um, as an automated test. I think that uh, would be very useful. Um, we have two pending pull requests. One is um, to support multiple hardware IDs and update these per updater. That is what I already told you so that one updater can emulate several logical simulators, but we only have to run one updater on one microcontroller. Um, that one is almost finished, so uh, we will probably merge that within the next days. And apart from that, um, Contributions are very welcome. Um, that could be in the form of bug reports, feature requests, code contributions, of course. And um, I encourage you to test this setup and let us know how it feels and uh, what else you need. Um, so testing is very welcome as well. And with that, I finish my small presentation. And if we have time, I'm happy to answer questions or comments that come up. Thank you very much. This minute or two for any comment or question from the audience. If not, then I encourage you to give it a try and let us know in the right on GitHub what you think and what you experienced. Thank you very much. Uh, it was You're welcome. Very clear. <laughs> so we can move on to the second part, with the second speaker uh, with Patrick. 
Um, he will be presenting uh, RPMS, uh, which is a real-time executive and is used in research and space exploration projects. Uh, Patrick, uh, can you share your yeah. screen? Uh, tell me when it's ready. You it can see ready. my screen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I put full screen. Yes. So hi everyone. Uh, I'm talking about today. I'm talking about uh, integrating micro ROS on top of a RTMS, which is a real-time operating system designed to work in space applications. So I'm uh, an Italian computer and robotic engineer that uh, in the free time loves to contribute to open source projects like this one. This is a personal contribution, not endorsed by my company. However, uh, since uh, I work on autonomous navigation architectures in ROS2, actually, uh, I'm, I'm, it's meant to be used in future works. So a bit of introduction about deep space hardware. In general, when you are in deep space, you need to use radiation hardened components. So CPUs, memories, and uh, uh, every kind of electronics that can sustain high loads of radiations. So there are various companies that produce rad hard CPUs. And uh, commonly, they are simple architectures. So the re reduced instruction set computers. Uh, but from uh, the production process perspective, uh, in 2001, we are around the 25 nanometer node instead of the commercially available 753 nanometers uh, that we have or we will have on smartphones. Uh, in particular, in the European field, the European Space Agency actively founds the development of a class of CPUs called LEON. And the LEON CPUs are multiprocessors based on Spark V8 architectures. Uh, in synthesis, we have very slow avionics to execute a lot of different real-time tasks. Um, RTEMS, the scope of this presentation is the real-time executive for multiprocessor system. It supports 18 architectures and more than 200 boards. It's an open source support symmetric multiprocessing, and it's almost, let's say, POSIX compliant. So it supports at least like 80% of the POSIX calls. RTMS comes as a set of libraries, so the application, you, you build your own application against this set of libraries and you get a full kernel, which is a monolithic application that you run bearable on your hardware. The European Space Agency in particular is uh, interested in the qualification process of such an application because you can't qualify standalone the system, you have to qualify the application that is using, is linking the system. Uh, and it's not a trivial task when you have to deal with uh, uh, multiprocessing uh, code. Our TMS is actually operative in a number of different NASA and ESA op um, missions, as well as other class of satellites like the Galileo uh, navigation sats. Uh, from my perspective, this combo of the RTEMS operating system and uh, target architectures sites such as uh, Spark, PowerPC, or ARM risk targets uh, are very interesting. In particular, my application uh, is about uh, autonomous navigation uh, that for now I develop with ROS2. Autonomous navigation on a spacecraft like, uh, I mean, the ExoMars rover or the Opportunity and NASA rover and all the other ones uh, is a very complex task. It uh, is a, a combination of perception, localization, mapping, planning, uh, trajectory execution, as well as, as all the locomotion tasks and all the uh, spacecraft generic tasks, such as the uh, thermal control loop, communication loop, uh, and as well. So, uh, in my opinion, to develop uh, algorithms for uh, autonomous navigation, ROS2 is a very viable solution. Uh, I currently use NAV2 uh, with ROS2 control for the locomotion and the robot localization package to keep simple the localization, which uh, uh, can't use uh, heavy uh, duty algorithms uh, like uh, the already uh, ready SLAM, so simultaneous localization and mapping packages. I think that. Uh, uh, ROS2 for now is very LiDAR-centric from the perspective point of view. Uh, and um, 
So pers perception and, loco and uh, localization, I think they still need to uh, go simple and uh, uh, custom. Uh, the interest, from my perspective, is to test algorithm running on target hardware because uh, you have to see if, uh, with the scale down of the performances, your control loops are still efficient, are still useful. And um, in my ex direct, direct experience, uh, in a comparison of different algorithms, let's uh, let's make an example: path planning algorithms. Uh, testing on different architectures can bring you to surprises. Uh, in my thesis work, for example, I switched from an Intel platform to a PowerPC 750 platform, and uh, it uh, just uh, changed the world results. So, um, in a very complex ROS2 architecture. It, micro ROS is very interesting because it lets you move just bits of your logic, so uh, just the one or more uh, nodes uh, that you want to benchmark to try on the target hardware. Of course, other reason for this, uh, let's say, Sunday project for me that it was a challenge, so it was uh, fun and uh, proved also uh, how easy it is to use MicroOS on uh, not natively supported uh, uh, real-time uh, systems. So let's start with uh, a, a bit of a tutorial, a guideline about um, the, the procedure. Um, first of all, you need an RTEMS uh, source code. So you download their own uh, source builder. It's a set of build scripts that uh, provide you with uh, a cross compilation toolchain for the arch architecture you choose. Then you download the RTMS, so the core of the operating system. This, this time uh, the version 5, which is a stable version. You cross compile with the toolchain you obtained at the step before. Then you download RTMS libbsd, which is uh, the library that uh, integrates RTMS with uh, a complete set of uh, uh, POSIX calls uh, and the networking support. And or again, you cross compile this library again uh, against your own RTMS5 uh, border support package. So these are, these are just uh, examples uh, that I leave uh, in the slide deck. As a reference, you just clone a bunch of repositories. First, the RTMS source builder, then the source code of the core, and then the uh, BSD library. And you build with your own set of script, specifying the version, which is 5, and uh, the uh, target uh, architecture, which in this example is ARM. So when you have an RTMS uh, uh, environment ready, uh, I uh, started to look into micro ROS. So I downloaded it. I noticed that in the micro ROS setup, there is the generate lib infrastructure that lets you specify your own CMake toolchain and uh, your own Qualcomm configuration, which is a set of defines. And uh, uh, after the first iteration of uh, um, build iterations, I came up with uh, a correct CMake toolchain file, a correct set of definitions, and um, whenever uh, applicable, uh, also some uh, the fix of some includes or some paths that were missing in this build configuration. Um, but uh, when I reached a certain step, I noticed that some symbols were still missing from my RTMS uh, library set. So. I, I dug into the uh, MicroOS source code and I noticed the uh, multi-target support. So there are switches for free RTOS, for example, as well as POSIX. So I added my own uh, boilerplate switches for RTMS. And then I started to look uh, where those switches were used. And in particular, they are used in the transports. So in the TCP, UDP, serial implementation, target specific implementation of the transport. Uh, so this is, uh, or, of course, for reference, uh, an example of CMake toolchain for the generate lib script. It's just about defining a library path, include paths, some flags for the compiler, and of course, where to find the RTMS libraries and uh, the right compiler to use for the ARM target. Uh, 
And this is how simple it is to use uh, the, the file I showed you before. In the last line, uh, there is the build firmware step of a micro ROS uh, setup where you have to uh, pass as argument the CMake toolchain and your own Colton configuration. Uh, so, uh, what was the problem with RTMS uh, mixed with MicroROS is that uh, by default, RTMS does not have support for the poll call, which is used in uh, read operations, uh, but only for select. Okay, um, you have to notice that uh, now in libbsd, in the libbsd uh, port for RTMS, uh, also the poll call is included. But I can tell you there are some custom BSP, so no, not mainlined, where there is not such support. And uh, so we, I still have to rely on select call. So in uh, the DDS client, I needed, of course, to implement the RT RTMS switch. And then I defined the new handles for the TCP and the UDP platform with uh, the structures that are used by the select logic. And then uh, it's as simple as define uh, four functions. So one for to open, for example, let's, uh, let's take the TCP, one to open a socket, one to close the socket, one to read in a polled mode, and one to write. After that, we have to test this uh, uh, new code. So we build a QEMU emulator for the ARM Zinc board with RTMS tools. We build a sample shell application, uh, RTMS based. We configure virtual network on our host and we run QEMU with this application just to test, to ping the host and test that uh, we have the proper networking setup. This is just the continuation of the previous CMake section, uh, but to compile uh, a, um, the demo application. So as a plain regular CMake app, you specify the target, you specify the compiler options, uh, you link against uh, both RTMS libraries and MicroROS libraries, and then you uh, specify uh, the set of libraries to link with. And this is how I set up the network, the virtual network on the host. So there is uh, a TAP network uh, with a bridge merging my Ethernet network, my Ethernet interface with the TAP network. And uh, on the right, you can see uh, on the top how easy it is to build uh, the uh, QEMU emulator uh, with RTMS tools and uh, how to run on the command line to set up both serial and networking. So uh, what's uh, in the end? Uh, after testing networking, and uh, if you can ping your own host, you are set. The only thing you need to do to get to the ping pong examples is just to create in the RTMS shell application a new shell command. OK, uh, every shell command in RTMS has an entry point that's just like the C main entry point. OK, so it has the same signature. You um, literally copy past the source code of the free RTOS, uh, RTOS example, ping pong example. And then you run both the emulator and the uh, micro ROS agent on your host. OK, and um, so this is how you define, you declare your application, your shell command, and the handle to register it uh, in the command line in RTEMS. So my uh, contribution is for both TCP and UDP transport, but I, I've left the MicroOS setup issue number 397 open because I'd like to keep track of more advancement. In particular, I'd like to implement or check if it works the serial transport. Uh, I'd like to develop some uh, um, MicroOS setup, setup scripts for RTMS. Uh, maybe try and check uh, the, um, uh, as well, other demo applications and uh, write uh, a proper end-to-end -end tutorial. Thank you for your attention. I'm uh, here if uh, you have any questions, of course. So just do you have in mind any practical application of uh, micro-rosin items? 
Well, you mean uh, in uh, in space, so in representative environment or in R and D? Yeah. Both. Okay. Uh, well, from uh, since uh, uh, for now it's a Sunday project. Uh, I uh, am not able to guarantee you that uh, some uh, some day we will see micro ROS uh, on uh, a spacecraft. Uh, but uh, NASA is uh, working uh, in uh, the space field with uh, ROS2, uh, so maybe in the following years we can see something new. From my perspective, for R&D perspective, uh, the, my uh, setup and my reference case is about uh, benchmarking, as I already said, on target architecture. So I will probably use it uh, in uh, the next um, uh, year. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we could write uh, something together for uh, any R&D proposal. So, of course, I will follow up with you. Well, my name is Jaime Martin. I am the CEO of uh, Proxima. Yeah. I also Can have I a question. Uh, we got... Oh, okay. I was just going to ask about. Uh, what what made Artem stand out over other o, uh, embedded OSs? Sorry about that. Uh, well, it's from my from my perspective, it's open source. Uh, I already used it in uh, some applications, so that's why I'm more confident with. And I was interested in uh, let's say let's see if MicroOS works also on RTMS. So it was a curiosity, and uh, RTMS uh, is uh, already operative in a number of different uh, applications in uh, my field of interest. So that's why I uh, I was curious about uh, this kind of integration. Awesome, thank you. But to extend the You're answer, welcome. I would say that uh, RTMS is uh, very popular in the uh, space sector. So. It's an important operating system if you want to run anything uh, there. Yeah, in space. Hey, I want to go to space. Let's do it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I have a question regarding your application. So you mentioned in the beginning you would like to use um, ROS control and NAV and so on to uh, control a robot. And uh, typically, ROS control has um, high frequency control loops, right? So let's say 1 kilohertz or 2 kilohertz or something. So I was wondering, um, um, what is the kind of the control rate you are um, you need on the microcontroller, and uh, do you currently have, let's say, benchmarked? Is the the current um, RCA CPP? I mean, if you would have the RCA CPP executor running on it, I mean that's typically um, too too slow or too high jitter. So what would be your, your requirement? I mean, for, for an executor, for a real-time executor on a real-time operating system, what kind of um, frequency uh, does it have to um, support? OK, um, real-time, uh, especially in space, it's not always about uh, high rates. Uh, for certain loops, uh, it uh, just need to be deterministic. And uh, the first application of this stuff is, uh, in, uh, is in heavy uh, computing algorithms, such as uh, path planning or perception algorithms. So this kind of algorithm, especially the global path planning, can run in the order on, let's say, uh, one hertz is good. Um, for now, uh, space rovers uh, are very slow. Uh, the ExoMars rovers uh, uh, plan uh, while stopped. So it's a stop and go process to walk, to navigate. Uh, and there is like 40 seconds between one loop and another one. Uh, so imagine how slow it is, it, it will be. OK. Um, so in my application, I'm not uh, keen into directly go with some uh, very high frequency control loop. Uh, since I'm interested more in path planners, probably it will be the first uh, kind of application. OK. So are you planning then also then just to use the default, let's say, RCLC executor to um, uh, to run your, your path planning then on the microcontroller? Or the, the, the path yeah, planning will so. be then done on the on on the host. Oh. 
No, no, no. I'd like, for example, to move uh, the global path planning uh, on the uh, on the target, so on the embedded application. Ah. Okay. All right. I've already done it in the past, but with uh, custom transport protocols uh, uh, to exchange the map and the result path, uh, and uh, this seems to me uh, the, the discover for me personally of MicroRoss an interesting uh, advancement. So, okay, uh, sorry, but another question on the micro ROS in the arts. So are you using it as a main transport in your demo te or the test you're doing? Because, I mean, I'm seeing it definitely micro ROS for sensors. I missed the presentation about micro ROS in, in, in the actual ROS2. What are you, are you worried about any control challenges, having things run through the agents, um, like latency or uh, I'm something not like that? Sure. I'm not sure if I understood the, the correctly the question. Uh, since I'm uh, uh, targeting to try to uh, uh, benchmark single modules to start with uh, on a target architecture, uh, MicroROS would be the uh, only transport uh, used in uh, the, the bench test. So to uh, the only way of communication between the uh, operating real-time operating system and the host. But I, I, I repeat, I'm not. Maybe I didn't understand. Sorry, part I'm of the people to help me believe in it more. I mean, I love it. I just wanted to any more examples to point me in that direction to say, Walter, you just got to think about it like this, and I'll be okay. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Patrick. This was really insightful. You're welcome. If there's no further questions, let's move. Just a, a final comment that I, I would like to see those tutorials on our web page. So, Patrick, when, when you want to start, uh, we are willing to help you to integrate the instructions, the tutorials, and other things in, the, in our web page and in our repos. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I I will try when I have free time, of course, since it's, as I said, a Sunday project, but uh, we'll do this. Thanks. Sorry, can you share the slides? I almost missed the first half. Uh, yes, yeah, um, maybe I, I can add the, the link. Please, and I can forward to, to the whole... Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, the last speaker of today, uh, Thomas Kolkum and Alex Malki from Fiat Poland, and then they will present the benchmark methodology, um, the results of Microsoft Galactic. Mm. Hi, Alex. Hi, Thomas. Are you ready? Hi. Hi. Yeah. I will be the one doing the, the presentation. Thank you. Uh, all right. So let me let me share my screen. <clears throat> ah, wait a second. You see something? Mm, yeah. Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending the today's WG meeting. Uh, I'm Alison Malki, and uh, Tomas and I are working on uh, the benchmarking tool for, for macros. And here we are going to deal uh, on the macros galactic. We are from Piaf, which is located in Poland. <coughs> And we are mostly uh, working on uh, robotic uh, systems. Uh, so, um, well, I will introduce you about the Shadow Builder, which is the tool uh, we worked on with Tomas, uh, the, uh, how we make the benchmark with this tool. And one use case, uh, a writer like your white paper, I would say, a white example, a white paper example or so. Uh, we can use it in some uh, flow, uh, like control flow, uh, workflow, 
and uh, some results between the last year. So when we did the benchmark in August, so that was dashing. Uh, we, we couldn't do the FOXC because on Edogant, so we just directly uh, did the comparison with the GIT where we'll see uh, the differences. So basically what is uh, the Shadow Builder? It's <coughs> a framework, uh, it's plugin oriented, it's code parser, instrumenter, and it's an interface with different different benchmarking tools. And uh, it's not a benchmarking tool per se, uh, and it's uh, not a result interpreter, so it's uh, up to you to, to use or to do this. The problem, the problem that we aim to take, tackle with this uh, shadow builder is that out there there are many benchmarking tools. We each of them are taking targeting different KPI, different uh, metrics. So uh, we want to reuse them as much as much as possible without doing uh, the same that it was done another time. <clears throat> uh, the platform dependency, so we want to be independent from which uh, platform you are, you are using. Uh, of course, that, that will depend as well of, of, on what you want to benchmark. Uh, yeah, like I said, we don't want to spend so much time on resources for developing the benchmarking tool. So uh, that's the reason for doing such a framework. And uh, what's, the, what's the goal is to avoid code overhead. So don't want to create a lot of uh, C file in the source base, uh, code base. and just for benchmarking, but just to keep this clear, uh, like some kind of clarity uh, with the code. And uh, what we want to avoid also is execution override, but this is also not happening. It will be uh, more likely to be dependent on the benchmarking tool that you, you would choose. <clears throat> uh, so here are the concepts. So the Shadow Builder is more or less like an uh, orchestrator. And it basically acts as a, as a kind of, uh, yeah, it's ordering and what to do in what order. And uh, we have the code parser, we have different type of code parser, uh, C and Python. Uh, there's the translate, the trace framework abstraction that allows you to uh, use your own plugins, to develop your own plugins or to reuse plugins that are already been developed. Uh, of course, all of these are uh, configurable, and mm, you will provide an output that is uh, computable, and that will actually then uh, provide you the instrumented code with the different elements uh, that you want to benchmark. So basically, what would I do to do this? There is a tutorial. There are some a set of tutorials that are available uh, on the GitHub on the on the uh, Macros website. And um, what is to be done is to write a plugin. So either you are lucky and something exists already, or you have to write your own plugin. And then if you if you are kind enough, then just share it with everyone. Uh, that is up to you. And what you have to do is to have a listener and the compatibility list. A listener is just a set of uh, um, uh, and um, a set of tags that you are listening to that are part of your uh, code base that will uh, then allow you to uh, replace these uh, tags to buy the piece of, of code that you really want. And the compatibility list, of course, it will uh, provide you uh, the code that is adapted, to, uh, the best uh, code that is adapted to your platform uh, according to your platform and your configuration file. So the tag will be, there's a specific syntax. You can create your own. And uh, this is all also available on, uh, on uh, the GitHub uh, as part of the tutorial. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, you can execute your code and uh, retrieve the result uh, in the end. Uh, the result are, like I said, up to you to, to interpret them. How we can interpret them? So in a very specific case of, uh, macros. We we implemented uh, the CTF on uh, this is the com common trace uh, format. The one it's available on Zephyr, uh, but on the, to keep the same baseline as the as the initial 
uh, benchmarking, we kept uh, the old Nutex uh, 7.29, if I recall correctly. And from that point, from that moment, so you get a set of binaries, serialized data that uh, I, some kind of compressed by the CTF, uh, CTF protocol. Um, as you see on the left is the binary um, binary format that is uh, that you capture from any medium. It can be Ethernet, it can be CIR, you choose it. Uh, you got the interpreter, which is the Babel trace. Uh, it's a tool uh, that actually is provided by, uh, which is free or uh, open source, and you can reuse it. And use it. You, there's an interface in Python. There's an interface in C. And for us on the side, we use Python to interpret the trace, and we could, for example, trace the different function call uh, to see which, where was what. And, uh, how many time was spent where? So that that was uh, one of our um, benchmarking um, <clears throat> uh, interest. Here, so that's one of the um, use case white paper we had in mind. We started to do this, unfortunately, couldn't finish it. But uh, yeah, the you have a community. The idea is that on this workflow, you have a community that is providing changes. Changes that, uh, of course, you will uh, provide on Git. You have all these different. Uh, I use Jenkins here, but you can have any kind of CI uh, that will execute the shadow builder or uh, script execution. And then in the end, you can re, uh, take, take FluentD, which is like more or less a everything to everything uh, trace aggregator. You can say something like that. that basically uh, allows you to really filter it and have have it displayed in a way that is meaningful to you and the community can share it. What are the different um, interesting uh, features that uh, in the end will allow uh, someone to choose one uh, RTOS or one special vanilla uh, branch or whatever that is interesting for, for, for the community or for a specific developer. <clears throat> now we are going to talk uh, a little more about the different benchmark results. Uh, what is that, what has been done so far? So to keep uh, in line, align with the previous benchmarking result we did last year, we are going to uh, um, talk about the communication, the RTS OS performances, the execution, the static memory, the uh, dyna dynamic memory, and the poor measurement. <clears throat> what is the setup? So yeah, this is we are using our Olimex STM32. We use the as a hardware references. Uh, the RTOS that we use is a uh, Netex 7.22 uh, with the common trace interface that we uh, added and. The application we, we use is a simple publisher just to, to see it. And as we did last year, we kept the same, same format. And uh, the communication medium benchmark we use are uh, the serial, the Ethernet, and the Cyclopan. So here on the communication, we are seeing that in general, there is not so many improvement on the Ethernet. Uh, you have to know that uh, the problem is that uh, currently I'm using uh, Linux box to, to make the, the, the different benchmarkings. And as, as a result, uh, there might be some packets that are sent that, that are not on my on my behalf. So the, maybe the data we see are related to this and create some, some kind of disruption. But in the end, we are more or less in this, in this 5% uh, range that uh, um, Okay, but in general, we that's the differences. In the six plan, we can see that we have an improvement in uh, improvement in terms of performance by a by a factor of uh, fifty percent, almost 33, 50 percent that provide uh, better TX results. The uh, RX is a little uh, little less, but that's not as much as. Uh, as the improvement for the for the TX and the CIR are very similar, uh, similar result in the end. 
the execution. So this is the execution. By this, I mean where well, the way we do it is we analyze the, the, the where he spend the most of the time uh, in the in the color stack, let's say. And what's happening is basically that we have uh, improvement in terms of uh, percentage of CPU usage, let's say. Uh, in general, uh, but like you see, most of the time, of the time, the, the, the different operating systems, uh, the operating system is is waiting for the I/O and the application as well. So one operation needs to be done, and you cannot do anything. If you have like something in between, you can do uh, to to use less time. But in general, there is an improvement in in the total uh, CPU usage for for uh, for the galactic versus the dashing. <coughs> The static memory analysis, and this was the biggest uh, one of the biggest uh, improvement uh, on the galactic versus the dashing is uh, that we have a factor of three almost that uh, was uh, the when I mean static, I, I'm uh, talking about uh, information um, data that are stored uh, on on the uh, on the um, be, uh, sorry on the uh, sorry on the stack and. Uh, therefore, uh, you can see that there's a much more improvement uh, on the dashing, especially on the Ethernet, uh, Ethernet, Ethernet uh, medium usage uh, is much less than uh, the one uh, that, than the one on dashing. Serial as well and galactic as well. There is a huge improvement in these two um, in these two uh, version. Uh, now the dynamic memory allocation. Uh, sorry, it was cut a bit, but you see here uh, the different block allocations per size. So I, the trays were chosen by multiple of two to to keep it uh, very software uh, uh, friendly. So uh, let's say that here we can see that the yellow block is all the blocks that are uh, more than 16 blocks, then there are 60 byte uh, large, but less than 32. And uh, you can see here that uh, most of the allocation that are done is uh, are much less in total. The number of allocations that are done in dashing are much more than in the one galactic. But not only this is that the, the bigger blocks um, are not so uh, present in the Ethernet and the serial. There is one huge in the six low pan uh, because the six low pan is on the R2, that's due to the RTOS. Where you have a diff, um, handling of the uh, of the uh, driver for the uh, six low pan driver, where you lose, uh, you cannot avoid it, unfortunately. But the rest here is showing uh, very amazing results in comparison to to I mean amazing result in Galactic versus dashing. The power consumption, which is very important, especially for the system. Uh, here we can see that on the Ethernet, because uh, as we see in general, we have less call uh, on the on the stack because the stack is not a, as big as it was before. We can see a huge improvement in in terms of uh, of, of uh, wat wattage uh, on the galactic. Unfortunately, for the <clears throat> for the for the six low pan, uh, which is in red, you do not see the so much improvement. Um, and in the in the CIR, we see a slight improvement as well uh, on galactic uh, versus dashing, which is uh, good uh, good for the, this <coughs> update system. So in, in conclusion, we can see that for the benchmarks, we have uh, a significant, a significant improvement, especially for the stack and heap usage. Uh, the allocation, as we saw, are not so many uh, on the heap and the stack. You will see that the call stack uh, and the, the static variables, uh, sorry, local variables that are on it are not uh, taking as many as much space as before. And uh, the power usage uh, has, uh, significant, has significantly improved, uh, especially on the Ethernet medium, and a little bit on, on the serial uh, medium as well. So that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Is there any time? Okay, now to finish, we will 
talk very quickly <laughs> about the latest enhancements that in microbes. Yeah, just in in two minutes. We have finally merged the RCLC actions. They are in the um, in the rolling branch because there is an AVE break, so we cannot merge backport it to, to Galactic or Foxy, so they are in, in rolling and they will be one of the new things in, in Hamburg, in Micros Hamburg next year. Uh, the second thing is that we have been improving the static operation in the RMW and now we are complete 100% uh, static in the uh, RMW level. So Micros, the only point where Micros uh, allocates uh, dynamic memory is in the RCL and in the RCLC, but in the middleware level, we have zero uh, bytes of dynamic memory with this uh, full request. And finally, we are working in, in implementing CAN FD uh, transports in the XRCDDS client and in the XRCDDS agent. We have the, the CAN FD already available in the, in the XRCDDS agent using socket can in, in Linux, Linux. And also we have a transport and, and testing transport of the XSDDS client using can FD using the same socket FD. And during this uh, month, we are going to release support for the uh, Renisa's RI series. We are going to implement a can FD transport on, on this hardware, on, on this specific hardware. So those of you who are interested in CAN FD uh, using Micros, uh, can, you can take a look on, on that. And we will announce when we release the release and support of the CAN FD. That's all. OK, thank you, Pablo. If there's no further questions, there's no topics added in the miscellaneous section. So we want to thank everyone for attending especially the speakers. Um, I would like to ask you to send me your slides in, in PDF, please, so I can forward them to the embedded working group uh, in the list. Also, the recording of this meeting will be online soon, and the link will be added in, this, in the meeting notes document. Uh, we will be back next year with more interesting contributions. So we wish you the best for the end of the year. Very nice holidays. And we hope to see you again in January. So have a good day, everyone.